So I'm going to um, share my screen because I've got some slides, but um, you should be able to do a kind of side by side thing on Zoom where you can kind of see me and you can see the slides. You don't have to if you don't want, you don't want to see me. That's fine. You don't have to see me. Um, if you don't want to see, if you don't want to see anything, then you can just kind of close your eyes, I guess. Um, but we're going to be thinking about the person of Christ during this second session and uh, I'll just pray for us as we start shall we let's pray together heavenly father you want your son to be glorified we know that uh, and so we pray that you would send your holy spirit to take the things of christ and show them to us we pray that the lord jesus would be glorified in the next few minutes as we look at him and marvel at the glory of who he is for us together. Amen. So, the person of Christ. Why should we spend time looking at the person of Christ this evening? Well, hopefully I don't have to defend that. Is it going to be good for us as Christians to spend time looking at Christ? Of course it is. Christianity is Christ. He's what it's all about. But let me just try and confirm for you that this is worth your time. We're not focusing in these sessions on Jesus' work and what he's done for us. That's a wonderful thing to talk about. But we're talking here about his person, his nature, who he is, what it means for him to be at one at the same time, perfect God and perfect man, to have existed as the son eternally, but in time to have taken on our flesh to be one person existing in two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation. Now those words were carefully chosen by Christians over a thousand years ago because they said, we've thought really hard about this, and this is the best way we can come up with to explain how Jesus is both God and man in a way that does justice to everything that the Bible says about him. Why do we need to be careful to describe Jesus' person accurately? Why is it worth taking the time to delve into Christology, the doctrine of the person of Christ? Let me give you four reasons, if I can. Why should we be, give a, a careful description of the person of Christ? Well, it matters, first of all, because the Bible says that it matters. 1 John 4. Verse two says this, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. 1 John 4 verse 15 in the same chapter, John says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. We must, says John, believe not just that Jesus is Lord in some kind of, well, whatever way you want to define it. We must believe and confess certain things about Jesus' identity about his person to be Christian, to live in God, to have eternal life. Notice we, we must confess both that he is eternal God and that he has come in the flesh. He is truly God and truly man and believing both about his person are non-negotiable for being one of his people, for having eternal life. It matters because the Bible says it matters, but also it matters because it is contested. It is contested whether Jesus is both God and man, but it's also contested what that means. Atheists, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses and liberal theologians all have beliefs about the person of Christ. The atheist doesn't believe him to be God, although they might respect his teaching. The Muslim doesn't believe him to be God either, although they would believe more about him. They believe he's a prophet an agent of God. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe something different to both of those, that, that he is saviour and that he is Lord, but he's not God, although they also think that they believe everything that the Bible says about him. But liberal Christianity, even more, claims to be able to use exactly the same words as we might about Jesus, but with very different meaning. Liberal theology is totally happy to say that Jesus was divine, was the God-man, uh, but they meant something very different by that. Let me read to you just a snippet from a, a, an early theology essay 
written by Martin Luther King Jr. I've got nothing against Martin Luther King Jr. I hope that I wouldn't be judged on something I wrote in one of my early theology course essays, but this snippet is just a perfect reflection of the liberal theology that he was schooled in. He says this, where can we in the liberal tradition find the divine dimension in Jesus? We find his divinity, not in his substantial unity with God, but in his filial consciousness and in his unique dependence upon God. It was his feeling of absolute dependence on God that made him divine. It was the warmness of his devotion to God and the intimacy of his trust in God that accounts for his being the supreme revelation of God. The same words, very, very different meaning. It matters because it's contested. It matters also because, because we love him. If we love Christ, we will want to study him, to think about him, to fill our minds with the scriptural portrait of Jesus. If you love a particular piece of music or a, or a film or a book or a painting or a place, then the more you go there or look at it or listen to it or read it, the more you come to love it. This will place me in all kinds of ways. But my wife and I rewatched the original Pride and Prejudice TV series, the 95 correct version every six months or so at least every year and I appreciate it more every time there are some lines that I never appreciated how well written they are how perfectly delivered they are I enjoy it more each time if you love something then to gaze upon it and come to know it better is a joy if you're married you you enjoy spending time with your spouse and getting to know them more and more that's part of coming to love them more we spend time thinking about Jesus because we love him and we want to love him more. And in fact, that, that activity of looking on Christ is not a kind of side project in the Christian life. It is the Christian life. It matters. It matters to carefully describe Jesus because beholding Jesus is the start, the middle and the end of the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Paul talking about um, people coming to know the gospel, coming to believe the gospel, describes it like this. For God who said light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That's, that's becoming a Christian, seeing God's glory in the face of Christ. Just in the previous chapter, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, he speaks he says this, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Growing as a Christian, says Paul, is being transformed into his image as we contemplate, as we look on Christ. And 1 John 3 verse 2 says this, when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. What will perfect us in heaven it is to see him as he is. Beholding Jesus is the start, the middle and the end of the Christian life. In fact, that's what's happening when we read the Bible or sit under a sermon. We are meeting Jesus. The Puritans made that their goal absolutely explicitly, that in preaching, people would meet Christ. John Owen said that the sermon is like it's like a garden in which you meet Christ, your beloved. And beyond all of those reasons why it matters. Well, we do it because it's a delight. It should be no chore to spend time thinking carefully about the Lord Jesus. It might be a chore listening to me, I accept that. But if I do any pointing to Jesus at all, thinking about him will not be a chore because Jesus's person, the person of Christ is glorious. If you love any other thing, if you study it enough, you will find its flaws and its shortcomings. Even Pride and Prejudice, the original series, is showing its age in the quality of the filming. Even some of the casting choices might not have been the best. Even the person you love, the more you get to know them, you will find their sin as well as the qualities you love about them, but not Jesus. He is flawless. To gaze upon him more and more is only to unveil more of his perfection. Again, as one of the Puritans said, he is an inexhaustible fountain of loveliness. If we're really studying him at all, it will be satisfying 
and it will be delightful. And so I hope that these sessions will serve the goal of glorying in the loveliness of Christ. Again, someone recently I wrote, uh, I read, wrote this, thinking of Jesus Christ is both the highest work of the Christian mind and the greatest delight of the Christian soul. Yes, I hope that there will be some clarification and some definition of trying to be clear, but that's the goal, it's the glory in Christ. Well, enough of the why, how. How will we proceed tonight and the next um, two Tuesday evenings, gazing on the loveliness of Christ? Well, we're going to take the great uh, hymn about Jesus in Philippians 2 as our kind of foundation. And I want to pull out from there three phrases, key phrases about Jesus' identity and his person and examine what each of those statements tells us about Jesus. Uh, pull in other pieces of scripture to illuminate and also to mine the riches of the past. There have been 2000 years of careful, loving attention to Christ by his church, guided by the spirit. Of course, that is subject to the authority of God's word, but there are great riches there for us to plunder. My suggestion is that if you have um, questions or comments as we go along, you can pop them in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on that, or you can email them to me in between and we can try and incorporate them at the end or um, at the next session. So we're going to turn to Philippians 2, and I suggest that um, if you've got a Bible still open, if you turn to that now, that'd be great. Philippians 2, we're going to read verses 2 to 11, and I have um, primed, I hope, um, Sam or Chelsea to uh, to read that, if that's all right. Yep. Would you like that now? Yes, please. Thanks, Chelsea. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you very much. So tonight we're gonna to pick out the very first phrase that Paul starts with here uh, in verse six, Jesus Christ, who was in very nature God. What kind of a claim is Paul making? when he talks about Jesus being in very nature God. Can we be precise about what he means and what we need to say about the way in which Jesus was God? I wanna start by quickly reviewing some of the ways in which people have thought Jesus was divine, which are wrong, which fall short of what Paul and the Bible say. And these are views of people who thought they were Christians, or, or at least thought they were honouring uh, Jesus. I'm going to start with um, what I would call human plus views of Christ, human plus views of Christ. On the one hand, uh, there's the view that Jesus was, was basically an inspired human. He was strictly human, but still the Messiah, God's chosen leader, very inspired. It's, sometimes it's called Ebionism about after some of the first one of the first groups who kind of put forward an understanding of Jesus a bit like that. It's something like a Muslim understanding of Jesus. Obviously, Muslims don't think Jesus was God or divine. It's very similar as well to the, to the modern liberal view. And they, of course, would say Jesus is divine, or we're willing to use that kind of language. But they'd say this is what his divinity means. Again, common kind of liberal phrasing for this would be, he was a man who completely opened his life to the influence of the divine spirit. One kind of notch up from that maybe are different views that could be headed adoptionism. 
It views that Jesus was born human, but at some point he was adopted by God, giving him special status and properties. So he becomes more than just a human. I call that the Spider-Man view. It's just like um, Peter Parker. Peter Parker in Spider-Man is a normal human being until he gets bitten by the radioactive spider and then he becomes more than a man and he can do all kinds of crazy things. Now, the problem for all approaches to Jesus of, this, of these kind of species of human plus views, apart from having to explain away verses like Philippians 2 verse 6, is what you might call Jesus' pre-existence. The Bible presents Jesus as having a history before his human birth. Now, that is obviously true in John's gospel. John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word became flesh before Abraham was I am. It's all over the place in John's gospel. Could someone say, oh, well, that's just John and John was written later and try and drive a wedge between the earliest Christians and later reflection on Jesus. No, I don't think they can because Jesus' pre-existence is in all the gospels. It's there whenever Jesus says, I have come. You know, Jesus says in the gospels, I have come. Where does he mean? Where does he come from? Well, it's not I've come from Nazareth to Galilee, for example, because when he says it, normally he's talking about his mission as a whole. For example, Mark 2, 17, he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 5, he says, don't think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's there on the lips of demons, perhaps even more impressively. Mark 1, 24, for example, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Doesn't sound like have you come from just down the road? Maybe most impressively of, of all, he says about his whole purpose in Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Think about it next time you come across an I have come statement in the gospels. Does it sound like I've come from just down the road to here? Occasionally it, it, it might be, but most of the time, no. They mean the same as what John says, what Jesus says in John more explicitly, that he is the one who has come down from heaven. Throughout the fabric of the gospels is woven his pre-existence. So unless you've been the whole lot, you kind of have to grant that Jesus presents, is presented in the Bible as having existed before he was born as a human. Isn't though there the possibility that Jesus could have existed before his birth and yet somehow be less than fully God? Well, yes, there is, of course. If you accept Jesus pre-existed his human birth, you've ruled out atheist views, you've ruled out Muslim views, you've ruled out modern liberal views, but you still might be a Jehovah's Witness. It's what we might call the Arian view of Christ because it was the teaching of Arius in the third century. That's the view that Jesus is the first and the supreme created being. He existed first as a spirit, like an angel, and then later became a man, was born. He's in the closest possible relationship to God, but is not himself God. A view of Jesus, Jesus in his nature as much more than a man, existed before being born, powerful, even the agent of creation of everything else, but not in very nature God, because God existed prior to him and created him. And the Arians great slogan which they kind of turned into a ditty and had rap battles in the street with the Orthodox Christians, their great slogan was, there once was a time when the sun was not. And that's what they would chant. There once was a time when the sun was not. As close to God as he might be, there's a gap. There's a gap. And of course, Arians and Jehovah's Witnesses claim that this is the teaching of the Bible. And they would claim that it's the later church that makes the teaching that Jesus is fully God. Now, unquestionably that is what the church teaches later this is 
how the Nicene Creed puts it, which was written to exclude the uh, position of Arians from being counted as Christian thinking, that Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father. Unquestionably, that's what the church later taught. But of course, the, the question that is interesting is what does the New Testament say? What did the early Christians think? Maybe you remember the, the kind of the Dan Brown quote from this, the bit in the Da Vinci Code, that's probably 10 years or so ago now, that film, that book. The quote was that Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote. It was the later church that decided to call Jesus divine, not the first Christians. It's also the approach of some atheist apologists. So Bart Ehrman, if you come across him, he would be one. He would say, as a, as a scholar of ancient history, he would say, well, the early Christian approach to Jesus is that he was more than just a man, but was far less than the later claim that he was fully God. How do we respond to that? I think the key way to respond to all these claims is to recognize that all such views of Jesus rely on there being a scale of divinity, like a spectrum between God and man. As you go up this scale, you get more like God, you get more divine, and as you go down, you get less divine. All these views of Jesus put him somewhere on this scale. Jesus is higher than man, but lower than God. Now, the, the adoptionists would put him lower on this scale. He's, he's closer to a human. He's a human being. He's been um, souped up by being adopted by God. The Arians, Jehovah's Witnesses, would put him pretty high on the scale. He's almost there at the top, but not quite. Not quite. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem is that this is not the way that the Bible represents reality. There is no scale of divinity in the Bible. There is the creator and there is what he has made, the creation. Everything that is not him was created by him and therefore he's not creator at all. Yes, there are supernatural beings, spiritual beings. Scripture makes clear that there are angels, demons, spirits, the devil, but in the biblical worldview they belong in the creation box they are created and therefore they are not God they're not partly divine they are created and not creator those are the only two categories there is no in between the line in between is just to show that what God has made is always dependent on him in fact the top circle there isn't a category at all it's only one one being one lord the creator and so when Paul says that Jesus was in very nature God. He doesn't mean that he is right at the God end of the scale of divinity. He means that Jesus must be identified as the creator God, the Lord. The Christian claim, the New Testament's claim, is not that Jesus is in the category of God, but that he is God. Jesus is part of the identity of the one creator God. How that can be is later then to be explained as the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is one in essence and three in person. But the key here is that Jesus is not on the scale. He's not on the scale up to God. He is God. He is not created. He is the creator. Now, I think once you frame the question like that, it's much more helpful. Frame the question like what is the New Testament evidence that Jesus is to be identified in this way, to be identified as the Lord and not as a creature? That makes everything much easier, I think. Rather than asking, well, what qualities does Jesus have that make us think he is, he, he is in some way like God, and make us think he is pretty divine? Don't ask that kind of question. That's a what is he question. Ask instead, who is he? Who is he? That is the question of the disciples after the calming of the storm. Who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? The Old Testament answer, of course, is only the Lord. There is only one who treads on the waves of the sea. The Lord 
God himself. And the New Testament doesn't come along and say, oh, yes, actually, there's someone else. There's another one. There's two in that category. No, it says that Jesus is that one. He is the Lord. That is there in John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That is his identity. That is who he is. It is there whenever we find people worshipping Jesus, like at the end of Matthew's gospel. It's unthinkable in Judaism to worship anyone other than the Lord because of the distinction between creation and creator. Romans 1 says that the fundamental sin is turning to worship created things rather than the creator. In response to some of the arguments of Bart Ehrman along these lines, a scholar called Richard Borkham goes through text after text from Jewish literature in the first century. And it doesn't matter how crazy and out they, they are, no matter how wacky spiritual beings they can imagine and talk about, they don't worship them. No one worships anyone other than the Lord, because it is written into the fabric of Judaism that you only worship the creator and not the creature. So to worship Jesus must mean you have identified him as the Lord. And that, of course, is exactly what they called him, Lord. And often in the New Testament, when an Old Testament passage that speaks about the Lord in a unique way that only the Lord could be described, in the New Testament it is quoted about Jesus. And that's, that's fine. The New Testament writers just assume you can take an Old Testament description that applies uniquely to the Lord, to Yahweh, God's personal name in the Old Testament, and replace the Lord with Christ, and it will work. It will work. Romans 10, 13 does it. Paul says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, meaning Jesus in context, will be saved. He's quoting Joel 2, which says whoever calls on the name of the Lord, as in Yahweh, shall be delivered. The same thing is there in Revelation. In fact, it's all over the place in Revelation. Chapter one of Revelation, the son of man is described like the ancient of days from the Old Testament. That's a description. He's described like that. That is his identity. The endings of each of the letters to the churches take a description, an Old Testament description of the Lord and just applies it to Jesus. Maybe topping all of them is what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. He takes the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The strongest statement you can get about the fact that there is only one God, the Lord. And Paul just enfolds Jesus into that without batting an eyelid, as if it's so foundational to him. He doesn't even have to defend it. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. But for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. He is the Lord, the creator. That is the identification that the New Testament makes of Jesus, all of which is to expand and to expound Paul's statement that Jesus was in very nature God. And that is the teaching of the church that is encoded in the Nicene Creed, which were, were we to be all together in person, I'd invite you uh, to recite together, but it doesn't work on Zoom. You know what kind of chaos ensues when everyone unmutes and does stuff together. But you can, if you want to recite it along with me, um, you'd be welcome to. This is what we confess about the Lord Jesus Christ, that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Not made. He is the eternal Son of the Father. He is in very nature God. Again, why is that so important? Why does it really matter to confess Jesus as not just God-like, not just divine, but in very nature God? 
Well, partly because it, it's a matter of worship. Worship's fundamental to our existence in the Bible. We exist to glorify God, to worship him and enjoy him forever. But we can't do that rightly if we don't know Jesus as the eternal son who is in very nature God, the one who the father wants us to worship. If Jesus is not God, if Jesus is a creature like us, it's idolatrous to worship him. I was once talking with a Muslim in Africa and he said to me, you know what, we, we Muslims, we honour Jesus more than you do. It was a friendly conversation, but he said, we, we honour Jesus more than you do because we don't believe things about him that aren't true. And of course he's right. If, if Jesus is who he thinks Jesus is, he's right. It would be idolatrous to worship him. But if Jesus is in very nature God, then it's idolatrous not to worship him. We believe he is true God from true God. And in our evangelism, therefore, we call upon the world to give him the worship that he is due. It's also crucial because it's a matter of whether Jesus truly shows us God or not. John 1.18 no one has ever seen God, God the only Son, who is from the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is how we know what God is like, and we couldn't know him in the same way without Jesus. Yes, the Old Testament shows us many things about God, his power, his invisible attributes have been seen from the things that have been made. His, his power is displayed in his great acts to save his people, his compassion, his love. David writes of his experience of God's love in the Psalms. And yet God is so different from us. There's no scale we can put him on. His love is so different from ours. Just think about the love of God. Our love, our love waxes and wanes. It, it comes and it goes. It's fluctuating. My love is always partially self-motivated. I get something from loving, even if it's just a good feeling. God's love's not like that. It is eternal. It is steadfast. It is always going before us, never reacting. He, he's totally self-giving in his love. He needs nothing from us. He's totally sufficient, totally happy in himself. All of which are great things about his love. But they can leave us feeling it hard to relate to. If God is so different from us, what... What does it mean for him to love and to have compassion on us? How can I truly relate to a love so different from mine, even if it's a good difference, even if it's better? Well, Christ, Christ is the answer because he it's just in very nature God. God, the only son who is from the father's side, has made him know. Our confidence that Jesus is truly God is our confidence that he truly reveals God to us. When we comfort someone in tragedy, someone who has lost a loved one, we want to be able to say, God cares. God cares about you. God cares about your pain. It is hard to say what that looks like, although we know it is true it, it, that God looks with us compassion. It is hard to say what that looks like for God in his perfect, infinite, self-sufficient life of eternal joy. But it is translated for us in the person of Christ. What we could not understand is made plain as day for us in the picture of a weeping man. In the account of Jesus weeping at Lazarus's graveside. And because Jesus is truly in very nature God, that is a true picture of God himself. Does God care about our grief? You bet he does. The eternal son of God, the one who was and is in very nature God, wept at death. And if you were there, you could have touched God's tears. You can only say that if Jesus is who we claim he is, who the New Testament claims he is in truly, in very nature, God. And what does it say about God the Father, that the one who is in very nature God, the eternal son, comes to us? Well, if he's not the eternal son, if he's not in very nature God, then the sending of Christ, it, it, is just God, who is not in his nature a father, creating a tool to do a job, hiring a worker to do what he won't do himself. Christ becomes, in fact, a means of God insulating himself from us because God doesn't want to get his hands dirty with creation. 
That's not the gospel. The gospel is that the eternal father sent the son he eternally loves out of love for the son to whom he will give the church as his bride and out of love for us. The gospel is that the eternal son out of love for the father and out of love for his people came to us to raise us up to enjoy their eternal love in eternity. It's only true if he is the eternal son in very nature God. Our only confidence in saying to people, or oh, do you know, want to know what God is like? We'll take a look at Jesus. Our confidence in saying that is that he truly is God so that he can truly show us what God is like. Our confidence that Jesus is in very nature God is our confidence that there is no hidden God. There is no God behind or outside Jesus Christ. What you see in him is God himself. Now that's, if we've grasped that, is amazing and wonderful. And I'd like to give you just a minute or two now to pause and to think and to reflect on that. Maybe to think about one way this week in which you would like to reflect more on the, the glory that Christ is in very nature God and shows you what he is like. Maybe one way to reflect on that this week would be to read a passage from the Gospels about Jesus, like the, the Lazarus account, and think through the lens, this is God. There is no other God than the one revealed in this man, weeping, healing, loving, dying. Just a moment then now to reflect in quiet on the Lord Jesus, the eternal son of very nature God, and then I'll pray. And then after that, I'll, I'll tee up what we're going to do next week. So let's uh, pray together. Charles Spurgeon said this, there is vastly more revealed in the person of Christ than we should be likely to learn in this life. And even eternity will not be too long for the discovery of all the glory of God, which shines forth in the person of the word made flesh. Those who would supplement this had better first add to the brilliance of the sun or to the fullness of the sea. Father, we uh, recognise that this is, a, this is a short time and a poor attempt to even glimpse the glory of the Lord Jesus. We pray that the glory of Christ would be more of our concern, that our heart would be more drawn to gazing upon him. Father, we pray that as we read scripture this week, as we meet with your people in whatever fashion we're able to, as we hear your word preached to us. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us that we are meeting the Lord Jesus. We are gazing on him. We're gazing upon your glory in his face. Father, we thank and praise you that he was and is in very nature God. He was and is the eternal son. We thank and praise you that we can know you truly through him. We thank and praise you that that truth of his identity as the one lord is the gospel is the gospel story of your love for us and we pray that our time over the next two weeks as well would serve that aim of glorify that you would glorify yourself in the lord jesus and that his he would be brought higher in our sight amen So what we will do uh, next week, that brings us nicely to where we want to be 
for next week. Uh, and that is to consider kind of the other half of that. How is it that the one who truly was God came to be truly man without ceasing to be truly God? Here's a kind of teaser question for you to ponder if you want uh, for next week. Did Jesus give up any of his divinity when he became man? Is there any aspect of being God that he had to give up to become man? And we'll, we'll think about that a bit uh, next week in the second session.